Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this first session of Open Access Australasia's Open Access Week events. Uh, my name is Ginny Barber. I'm the uh, Director of Open Access Australasia, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to this first uh, event of the week. Um, I will just do uh, just a few um, introductions and housekeeping before we start, and then we'll get into the meat of the session. Uh, next slide, please. So before we start, I want to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia um, and acknowledge their connections to land, sea and community. I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, both on the call and elsewhere. And just to acknowledge for me, that as many of you know, this has been a very difficult week in Australia uh, following the referendum. I mean, in particular, I want to recognise that Open Access Australasia, um, we, we live on the lands of, of, of uh, a number of uh, um, uh, First Nations owners. So the Turrbal and Yagra in, in Brisbane, where I am, the Bedigal in uh, Sydney, and the Urugandi, Dabuge and Gimu, Warabara, Yadindi, as a, who are the First Nations owners of Cairns. Um, and I would like to also pay my respects and extend that to all Indigenous people, wherever they are in the world, including the Naga Iwi Māori, the Tangata Wenua of Aotearoa New Zealand. And if I make, if I don't pronounce that right, I really apologise. I'm doing my best. Um, you're very welcome to correct me. Um, if you would like to write in the uh, in the chat where you're from, that we very much welcome that. Uh, so the next slide, please. So just some, the usual housekeeping. Um, we have we have more than two hundred people uh, registered for this session. Uh, we would appreciate it if you would um, keep your microphone off. Um, <laughs> It will be muted um, uh, throughout the session um, and we will uh, record this and it will be online um, afterwards. Uh, please uh, note we'll also share it under a CC BY licence. We have a Slido chat um, which you'll be able to type your questions into and we will also have the chat open so you're welcome to write in there and we will um, be answering uh, questions at the end of the session. We'll be keeping to time. So the first thing just to say is um, I want to acknowledge that this is the first session of Open Access Week events for uh, for this for Open Access Australasia. Um, this whole week was brought together by a group of um, individuals who volunteered. We had uh, so myself from Open Access Australasia, Janet Catterall from JCU and Open Access Australasia, um, um, Sandra. Um, Fry from uh, QT and o Open Access Australasia. It was chaired by Richard White from Otago, um, Donna Coventry from Auckland University of Technology, Lyndall from Massey University, um, uh, Garth Smith from Waikato, Zach Kendall from Melbourne, Arthur Smith from Call, the Council of Australian University Librarians, and Marissa Cassin from Waikato. So a really diverse group of people worked to bring this together and I'm it was a, a real delight to work with everybody. Um, open Access Week is a, an opportunity to, to join together, take action and raise awareness about open access. Um, it's, a really, um, it's a really important week um, globally and this, the theme this year is community over commercialisation and that was set um, internationally. Um, this theme aims to encourage a really candid conversation about which approaches to open scholarship prioritise the best interests of the public and the academic community and which, which may, may not be so helpful. Um, Richard White, who is the chair of our committee, um, has written a guest blog on it, which is available on our open access website. Um, and it's what does the word community mean to you in the context of teaching and research? Um, the UNESCO recommendation on open science, which came out in 2021, also highlights the need to prioritise community over commercialisation. And it goes back to um, a, a, a definition of open access right from 2003, which um, talks about uh, an old tradition and a new technology which converged to make an unprecedented public good, which I, I think remains one of the best statements about open access that's ever been out there. So the session today looks at the ways communities can openly share their knowledge. Um, it also explores how sometimes community and commercial interests can coexist. Uh, different communities have different needs, aims and priorities about the knowledge they hold and create, and there can be a tension between open access and community control of that knowledge. So we're going to explore how do communities keep control of their knowledge while opening it to the world um, and uh, how can open access be used to strengthen those communities. So the first session for the first hour is a panel discussion, which I'm, I'm delighted to be uh, chairing. Um, and we have three fantastic panellists that I'm going to very briefly introduce and then we'll get into the meat of the session. So the first, uh, sp first speaker is Welby Ings, who's a professor of narrative divine 
Design at Auckland, Auckland University of Technology, the coordinator of the Rainbow Initiative, um, uh, which gives voice to rainbow knowledge, and he describes himself as a disobedient thinker, which I think is a great uh, description. Margaret Warren is the Director of Digital Delivery at the State Library of Queensland, which is one of my favourite places in Queensland. There's a wide range of library experience, uh, including delivery of collection development, project management, development of digitisation standards and guidelines and online delivery, audio, video, uh, library management systems and systems librarianship. Uh, and uh, uh, they're part of Open Access Australasia. And Napira Riley is the Chief Executive Officer of Figure.nz and a member of the Maori Data Sovereignty Group. Napira works closely with Maori business and educational efforts across New Zealand and has also held positions with New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, the Ministry of Health, um, University of Auckland and Manukai Institute of Technology amongst others. So we have a fantastic panel to kick us off today. All right, so I'm going to start off with um, questions for the panellists and uh, we're going to try and keep as quickly as, as much as we can to time. So first off, um, would I'd like to hear Tell us about your open collection and the work you've been doing and we're going to try and give to keep to two minutes for the, this first part. So Welby, I'll, I'll kick off with you if I may. Uh, kia ora everyone. Uh, so uh, my name's Welby Ings. I'm on the overground. I'm a professor of design at AUT University. On the underground, I'm a gay activist with a criminal record. So this project that I've been working on had a three-year lead-in, and it's basically uh, EAR. It's called EAR, and it's a portal that allows people, no matter whether you are a student who's 15 in a rural community, um, somebody in a retirement community who's looking for research about men who come out over 50, or whether you are a parent with a trans child, to be able to access instantly any research done in our university by our queer community. So we've this has had about a three year lead in. Um, we were digitized, we started digitizing many years ago. So what it means is that um, there are now over a hundred articles, books, films, screenplays, reports, exhibition catalogs that have been generated either by postgraduate students or by staff inside the university that you can get at through EAR. And EAR is a Maori term. Yeah. It's got, two meanings so on one level here is a pronoun that has no gen has no gender fixed to it but it also means to flow to to flow outwards or to flow like a current so the principle behind it was that people should be able to get information that should be able to flow out because as a university that's our job is to generate information and allow the flow to be accessible to everybody Thank you. That's a fantastic descri description, and I love the I love the concept of flow. I think that that really talks to what we're all about, really. Napira, would you like to go next? Uh, tēnā rā koutou katoa, um, ko ngā Peter Riley tōku ingoa, um, ko te arawa te waka. Thank you for having me today. Um, Kia ora, um, we work with a charity. Our charity is figure.nz. It's the name of our charity. It's also the name of our website. Uh, primarily what we do to serve our community and our focus is our communities um, is we open data. Um, we fundamentally believe that public data that's collected for and about people in our country should be made accessible. Um, we started as a charity and not as a commercial operation uh, because fundamentally we wanted to we wanted to build technology that was accessible. Uh, we could see a, a world in which our country was going to come more inequitable between those who could access and understand information and in particular data and those who couldn't. So we've been around for about 12 years, um, our little charity. We build technology that opens data from about 175 government agencies and councils. We make it digitally um, accessible. Um, and if you go on our main website there, uh, we launched a Māori Data Hub in 2020, followed by a Pacific Data Hub, a Disability Data Hub, and one for Rangatahi. And we're currently working with uh, Ministry for Ethnic Communities. Um, we know that data is a really powerful tool um, and we wanted to stay 
independent of government and both corporate, uh, because we really want people to trust the information. And our only agenda is to serve our, our people and our communities. So we like to focus on um, underserved communities as our starting point, um, but we do serve everybody. Um, we love data and access to information. Um, it's a big job. And um, yeah, we look forward to working with others. Um, but yeah, kia ora. Thank you, that's fantastic. Margaret, over to you. Um, hi. Um, the, uh, very, it's really great to see the diversity of the collections we're talking about. The collection I'm focusing on at the moment, uh, which is one that's a, a sort of an ongoing project at State Library, is to increase the openness and access to the letters received um, from to the colonial secretary during the early colon early history of the colony of Queensland. So from 1822 to 1859, 1860, around about that time period. Um, it's only available on microfilm. It um, it was only available on microfilm, but it's been digitised and had uh, HTR, so automated uh, transcription of 19th century handwriting and a, a big project to um, correct that transcription um, and then look at the development of a portal that makes this material much more easy to access than access than it currently is. So it's really about it, and it's really <clears throat> touching a number of lenses um, for researchers, including family history research, um, understanding um, the development of the colony. There's quite a lot of material that will support uh, truth telling and reconciliation exercises um, in Queensland as we try and push forward in that way, and also um, Indigenous languages and other First Nations stories. So it's a a very valuable resource that's been very hard to um, navigate and find your way to. So our, our process has, has been completely around thinking about how can we make this as, as available to as many possible people and how can we make access to it as intuitive and simplistic, uh, not yeah, simple rather than simplistic, um, intuitive, um, simple, and also to have the ability to understand this in a nuanced way. Thanks, Margaret. I really like that concept of you know simple and able and as a as a as a kind of model and intuitive. I think that's incredibly important when we're talking about you know access to to co collections like the ones that you're you're um, describing. Um, so let's let's just go do a bit more of a deep dive. So, um, well, we I'll get back to you. So, um, you've you've touched on this a little bit, but do you want to just perhaps some um, dive more into you know what's this cl open collection for? What's your open collection for, and why is this collection important to your community? And then I'll I'll, I'll give everyone else a chance to talk on that. Sure. So the the we understand the community is not just the queer community. We understand that as our families, our communities, the businesses and organisations for whom we, with whom we work. So, but it's very important to us because historically we have been erased through invisibility. So, you know, in if you go back to 6th of May, 1933, that footage you see of the Nazis burning books, that was our library. So that was, you know, that was the Magnus Hirschfeld, the, the library, which was the first and only existing library studying um, sexuality. Above that library, there were rooms where our trans people were staying so that they could have uh, for free because they couldn't afford the operations. So um, we go to America at the moment and we see the, the protests against drag, drag queens performing in libraries. We see that our books are still the most commonly pulled off shelves in the US. Um, so in 1986, when we were fighting for a homosexual law reform in this country, the arson attack was on our libraries, on our archive. And um, so we have a, a history of being wiped away. And either that is direct or it's through invisibility. It's, it's through us never being able to stand up in the public domain without being mediated first, without some filter going over it. So, um, it, and we know that at the moment, even though we might sit in countries that we think are, are very embracing, you know, in 65 countries or, or our jurisdictions in the world at the moment, we're criminalized. Yeah. In, in 12 of those, our trans people are arrested. And in 14 of those, we are killed. So the world for us, the, the, our national world and our global world are two very different places. And the second one is very unsafe and it's very, it's very active. 
So, um, but our university, so this is, as far as we can see, this was the first time in the world. There had been examples of portals like this brought in in certain disciplines, but this is across the university. So AUT has doubled the national proportions of students, of, of people who identify as rainbow coming in. So, you know, um, uh, 1,800 of our students currently identify within the rainbow communities. That's that's openly. Uh, we have 25 years of staff activism. Uh, um, we're the so we have a thing called the Rainbow Tick and the Rainbow Pride Pledge. We were the first university to get that. So the university is very forward thinking, but it's been driven that way. It didn't do that by stumbling. It's been driven just just by a long time commitment. I mean, Napiro will know the same thing in 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 you know in our other communities. We we drive forward. So that's why there is and it's important to us because invisibility is our oppression, and it's our it's our unsafeness. Thank you. That, that's really powerful. I, I was very taken by you say, you know, this was driven forward that take rather than by stumbling forward. We have to have leadership in this area. And I, 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 you know, I think that's a really important message for everyone to hear here. Um, uh, Margaret, I'll go to you next rather than going around yeah. in the same order. Yeah, yeah. I think it's um, I think uh, that's really it's um, some really interesting, um, interesting points that are being made there. When I think about the colonial secretary's correspondence, so this particular project, but expanding out more broadly into, um, into what we might, uh, if I think of the community being the library community, um, in this context, um, exercising control over the content of our collections, um, is actually about making those intentional decisions from the point of digitization to the point of discovery that our control is actually more about how do we relinquish control but do that in a way that um that allows people to understand that it comes from the, the place that it comes from but one of the i think one of the strategies for us is obviously we have large collections we want to digitize and sometimes we um, enter into um, public private partnerships to do that digitization work and that's probably something where there's been a lot of leadership and i, I pick up on that um, point that um, you made Ginny, about um, welby's thing it doesn't happen without leadership and driving things forward and that leadership Leadership has been around developing principles that the national and state libraries use when a private company comes to us and wants to support digitization and they're a professional company and you know a profit-making company and how we can be really intentional about choosing um, where we will move ahead in a private public partnership and where we won't move ahead in a private public partnership and what are the questions we need to ask to make sure that access to this material is controlled in the way that we would like it to be controlled? Um, and that um, that if there are embargo periods, that they're reasonable. And if if it's for if it's you know for our particular users and it's going into a into a database, that we'll get free access to that ahead of a paywall rather than behind a paywall. So really thinking about the things that will help us get content online that we need to get online so that it can be made open and not caving to, um, to commercial interests on things that are to their advantage rather than things that are going to help our community. And when I think about our, representing our community of researchers and users for them to be able to use this material in the way that they want. So that's a real that's a real tension, and I think that idea it has been an area of tension. But then having, I guess, um, an industry wide standard within sort of the the library environment to say, well, we're going to ask critical questions, and if the vendor is not able to give us the guarantees that we want, we're going to be prepared to walk away. Because then we won't end up with some of the situations that have happened in the past. I think particularly the, um, for me, the British Library with the, uh, with the London newspapers, you know, that that is almost perpetually behind a paywall um, because it was a huge digitisation job at the beginning and there was too much, there was a power imbalance between the holder of the collection and the vendor that was wanting to make it available. So we need to make sure that that power is balanced in a way that serves our interests as institutions that are about the open sharing of knowledge. Thanks, Margaret. We might come back to this question about um, the, the, the the example that you've given on the, the yep. I think that's really fascinating. Uh, Napira, I'll go to you next. So just going back to the, um, the concept of the community and what your what your open collection is for and its importance to your community. I wondered if you wanted to expand on that more. 
Um, yeah, well, I think when it comes to open data, which is what I do, I open publicly uh, available data. So it's data that's kind of already been released by governments, if you like, and we only work in um, aggregate data. So that must be said because there's a complete difference between opening personalised information and opening aggregate data. Um, we think it's really, really important that uh, we have a community focus, uh, especially because data has been so commercialized over the last 10 years and there's like, like been this big race um and like i said we we wanted to democratize our public information um and we wanted to do it with 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 uh governments and with um public and private partnerships actually um 10 years or 12 years ago when we had the idea to build this technology and open it for communities uh people were a little bit worried because we were still we were still trying to convince governments back then that they should open their data there was a lot of fear around you know the data wasn't being collected for the purposes of sharing with the public so there was still a lot of fear around governments opening data at all um and why should the public um have access to it at all um but we're past that now. We're past that now. And, and we, we can fundamentally, hand on heart, saying op opening data is really good. Um, but why do we have to focus on communities? I think it's really important for a number of reasons. The communities that we serve, I, I like to call them important to reach communities rather than hard to reach ones. Um, there's just so much information out there, right? There's so much data being collected in so many different ways to find it that we wanted to help make it easier for communities. A lot of data that's collected in Aotearoa, in New Zealand anyway, I'm sure it's the same in Australia. It's kind of, a lot of it's a byproduct of a service, like you register your dog or you have a baby or you register your car, you get sick. So it's all data sets that are being collected. Um, but as it might, as you might know, when it comes to Indigenous people or Māori people, what happens then is that the data is being collected about you and when you see it pointed back at you it's like this deficit data that's we're seeing ourselves reflected as we don't own homes we are less educated we are high in crime all of these things now that's you know the data is what it is but um sometimes that's why Māori data sovereignty and other um, areas are really important because we want to see ourselves in other data too. And actually, if we have a say in who's collecting it and what's being collected, the same will happen with our rainbow community and our disability community. You will start to see data sets that um, better reflect us as humans and people and bring us into the centre of the data rather than just having data kind of collected about us. Um, so in our Māori data platform, you'll be able to see in there, there is education education data and crime data and all of that. Um, but they're now data sets being uh, collected by our people and thoughtful academics that are going in and spending a lot of time asking the right questions. So now we are starting to see not just data that's a byproduct or things that are collected, but intentionally collected um, data that we can see ourselves and use for the purposes that we want, rather than kind of going to the closest data set and going, oh, that one serves our purpose. Uh, we can start to see ourselves better reflected in data. So I would say it's less, less about community control, more about access is my thing, who can access it and why. Um, and also having data sets that are intentional um, and collected and you know um, curated, if you like. Um, but yeah, it's a big topic, but I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> That's fantastic. I, I, I love the way we've gone to the topic about control and how important that is for each of the collections. Um, well, would you, would you like to kind of comment on that? Because I, I think we, um, that's something I, I feel like for your community, that would be especially important. You know, it's so good in your heart to hear other communities talking about the same thing as, you know, as I said, our narratives have been mediated you know, you go, you know, I'm currently putting a documentary together. The stuff that got, to, because our archives were, were firebombed, it's all through the filter of the newspapers of the time. So we only see outrageous or exoticized stories about ourselves in, in states of aggression, not in states of construction, not in states of care, not in states of, of love. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we see, we see, because the filters are there, we are shaped in a certain way. And part of the open access concept is to dissolve those filters and allow the voice 
to rise up in its true form and then that to be accessible by people. And that's why it's such, and that's why open access on a deep level is so important. I was really touched by the point you made um, around that data collected about your community reflected black through a deficit lens and or through, or I guess, well, you were saying through an um, um, uh a weaponized lens in some ways and um, I think that that's actually that is a really when you start talking about control about data about uh, particular people groups or demographics or things like that there's something super powerful in being able to have that control to actually reflect the data back through the lens that and it's 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 about actually di different ways. It's the same data, but you can actually tell a positive and empowering story, or you can tell a story that's around deficit. Or in the case of our uh, in in the case of something like uh, the collection that I'm thinking about at the moment, we can tell we can tell reflect that data back through lens that are a truthful and authentic um, recount of what the um, lived experience of First Nations people at the time, um, even though it's recorded through recorded through the usually through the um, correspondence of um, you know white settlers, but we're actually getting in terms of understanding uh, what the experience of First Nations people was is to actually read that commentary and look at it through an authentic lens and a sympathetic and a human lens and say, wow, People spoke about First Nations people in a way that was, you know, incredibly, um, you know, it, it seems anathema to us. So it gives that more authentic way to do it. And unless you, you know, from your concept, um, unless you can uh, look at that data and, and slice it, dice it in, in ways that are authentic and meaningful for your community, that could be about how to grow, how to act, how to use your activism more effectively, how to actually um, take a strengths-based view of the data that you're looking at. Um, that's one of the reasons I think why you need both um, both openness, radical openness, and you also need to have appropriate control so that your data is not used for purposes that are um, anti-ethical anti to the goals that you had in making it open in the first place. Yeah, yeah thanks for that, Margaret. I, and I feel like um, a lot of the questions we're touching on here are all interrelated, but I, I did want to get to um, just, I guess, one final one for all that I'll ask each of you and then we'll we've got some fantastic comments coming in through the Slido and through the chat I the um the the um the audience is kind of having a whole conversation themselves about this <laughs> which is fantastic so I guess um given this this week's theme about community over commercialization I would just like to get from each of you how why and how you made the decision about an openly openly accessible collection would serve your community and what ways does it being openly accessible help rather than whether as opposed to a commercialized approach and did you have that conversation i guess when you were thinking of setting this up so um uh margaret i might start with with you on that one sure i'll just put my timer on so i don't take too much time <laughs> you shut cut me off if i do um i think you know certainly what d deeply sits at the core in, in in the library world is that idea of access to information and ideas so that um, a citizens can be informed. So there's that real driving force but um, in libraries uh, anyway to the extent that we possibly can. So having that, <clears throat> and, I, and I think this, you know, this decision made for this collection or any collection that we would be making now is built upon decisions and discussions that have happened really over the last, particularly over the last 20 years as we've gone in more into the online world. Um, and it was really saying, well, let's champion Creative Commons licensing for for um, collections for which we own the intellectual property for, and let's make um, um, attribution or attribution non-commercial the, the the type of license that we do and grapple with that. Let's not transfer. Um, well, let's remove the permissions barrier for our out of copyright collection material. Let's not just transfer analog processes into the digital world. So you've got a whole range of decision points that happen um, further on uh, to to get to this point where it actually we wouldn't even have had 
a discussion in our mind about should we or should we not make this um, openly accessible. It was a self-evident decision. So as we, you know, as you work through that, um, you get to that point. Now, of course, there are, you know, and I, I will, you know, there are caveats with our collections around, you know, sort of, well, let's look at um, First Nations material, you know, there's a whole range of protocols and community consultation and collaboration with that sorts of material. But, you know, the, the, we work through that process and, and we've been on that journey to, to look at open, um, openly accessible material. And I don't think there's any, there's any, I think there's a, a greater need for libraries in particular to be advocating um, for that more significantly, and I think, Welby, you you touched on it lately, you know, there have been challenges to books being held in library collections right across, you know, in public libraries across Australia, um, you know, it, it very much so in the United States, but it's coming into our world here. And so how do we have a position, we must have a position, and, and we're sort of working on that here at State Library of Queensland, that says libraries are about openness, libraries are about access, libraries are about intellectual freedom, libraries are about human rights and dignity. So therefore, libraries should be looking for openly accessible collections where at all possible, notwithstanding that there's going to be consultation in some particular types of collections before we make them um, openly accessible. So for that is, is really the driving force for me, but it just doesn't happen. It hasn't happened in a vacuum and it won't continue to happen in a vacuum because as we push further, further forward and, you know, and obviously the scholarly communications is the, you know, is the hotbed of pain um, where there's such vested commercial interests in um, maintaining, uh, sorry, in, in control being um, in the hands of publishers, not in the hands of the people who are creating the data. So I mean, I see that as the place that we need to keep advocating and pushing for. Um, but we can do that um, collectively as different parts of the community, making sure that we're guided by what is best for our communities. Thanks for that, Margaret. Actually, I was I was very interested that you touched on the um, the idea of the commercial versus non-commercial licenses. And, and I think what, what that speaks to me about is the real critical need to understand, you know, the, what what these licenses all mean because, you know, we know we know, don't we, that you know, free is not the same as open. That you know, making yep. something free can be taken away, and and that's a really critical part of what we're we're all advocating hmm. for. I think. Hmm. Um, Napira, I'll go to you next. So, did you, was there ever a conversation about um, that you know it being commercial that uh, figure NZ or is um, how how did that discussion go? Like honestly, all the time. Um... <laughs> As you know, uh, we're a technology company. It's not cheap to build technology. It's not cheap to hire technologists. Um, thankfully, we started from the beginning with our purpose. Our purpose was to solve this problem of New Zealand's information being disparate. There was 175 government agencies collecting data on different websites, all in different formats. There was no standardization at all. Um, and it was a rather a big mess. We actually started as Wiki New Zealand. Uh, we had the idea was to build the technology kind of like Wikipedia and that everybody would um, put their own data sets and, um, you know, have a place where people could come and um, have their data sets added and, you know, we would curate it as a team. So it started off as, as one idea. Um, there was never any question. All our data was always going to be Creative Commons licensed. It was always going to be completely free for people. Um, we just had to figure out the how. Now, experts all told us it can't be done. It's too big a problem. The tech, It's just too hard. You're never going to solve it. And if Stats New Zealand, who are our Statistics New Zealand, who are our, our friends now, and the, the, the government department, if they couldn't solve it with their 1,700 staff and millions of right. dollars of funding every year, a, a small charity certainly could not talk, uh, certainly could not do it. Um, but we still had this fundamental belief and idea. Um, we held like a hackathon. And um, so the first few years of our existence, uh, none of us got paid. It was all a voluntary situation. And we just started to hack at the problem and we just didn't want to take no for an answer. Like there had to be a better way to do data. We reached out to government agencies at the beginning. Um, everyone just kind of told us we were crazy. It was just not even going to be possible, even with all the money in the world. Um, but hey, we had an idea. We went for it. And um, I'm really glad we did. Um, and now 
we've had over 9 million people access our site. Um, we help huge amounts of community. Um, advocacy is one of our biggest things that we do. We provide data for people who are advocating for various issues or policies. Uh, small businesses can now access funding. I work with Ministry of Social Development, helping Māori and Pacific businesses uh, do market validation. Um, a lot of data literacy, which is where we ended up. We, we thought we'd just do the open the data and put the data out there and everyone would use it. Uh, but we realized we had to actually go through a process of bringing our communities on the journey with us um, and teaching them what is out there and then being available to answer questions. So, yes, it's come in very helpful, very handy. Um, a lot of different people use it for a lot of different reasons. Um, we're very happy we went with the Creative Commons license. It makes it very easy. But I think also starting with the principles of why we were wanting to open the data and how we were going to do it, um, even though it was hard, we managed to push through. And so thankfully now we have the support of governments uh, to to keep our work going. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking all the time, as a CEO, I wouldn't recommend the business model <laughs> of making <laughs> everything free. Um, it's very, very hard, um, but that's okay. Sometimes you have to go with your idea and your heart and the money will come later. Um, but it's certainly from a financial perspective been very difficult keeping our funding coming in over the years. Um, thankfully, we had this big thing called a pandemic and it became very, very clear why we needed to collect data about a lot of things uh, because you never know what's going to come and you never know when people are going to need that information. So our idea is if we just keep backing up our um, the, the back end of Grace or the website. Um, so all of that data just gets updated every day. We are updating more and more data sets um, with the specific idea to help people and help them find information. It does come to loggerheads when we talk about Māori data and Māori data sovereignty, um, but we kind of get around that with the the whole, this is aggregate data, so we want to protect the personal information, the whakapapa, the histories, and we want to, for me, I want to share everything else that is aggregate because we just don't know who's going to use that data and there might be, I, I, I know in my heart, communities, they do some really fantastic things with this information, things that commercial people and government people wouldn't even think of. So that's our core reason behind doing our work, is to empower people through access to quality data. That That's, yeah, that's fantastic to hear. It's a, it is interesting how, you know, the, the great thing about open data and open research is that you just never know what somebody's going to do with it. And it's always better than what you could think of. I mean, that's the power of community. So yeah. 9 million people using it. That's a pretty powerful demonstration of its importance. Um, so I'll go to you, Welby, and then we'll go to some questions from the audience. So um, did you, was there ever a conversation about, um, you know, your your work being sort of commercialized or um and did you have that conversation how did that go so there was a conversation and i'm going to try and do this in six ideas um so our first conversation at, at the university was in uh, the big one was in 2006 and that was when the idea of open access and digitizing research for open access that was when that was raised there was consternation there was a polarizing i would say there were more people on the anxiety level than there were on the euphoric level um and then in 2008 we our, our repository migrated to dspace and then in 2000 by 2016 we had what we call tufera which is all theses that are are done here are now digitized and available you can have some protection around certain information that you don't want online, but those are special circumstances. So we had an infrastructure sitting there. The conversations we had were around being intellectual refugees so that we get many students from countries where it's not safe to study queer issues. And they come to New Zealand and they come to our university to study, but they are vulnerable because once their name goes into the public domain along with that research, their families or, I mean, I've had students who have traveled overseas who have been stopped at airports when someone Googled their name because they thought it was a little bit unusual and up comes homosexuality in their profile of their research. So we know we had to give a lot of thought to the fact that we have intellectual refugees and we have to protect them. So all stuff that goes on there is by permission of the researcher. Um, and that also includes a significant number of staff research for pe people overseas. It's not safe. However, we pursued it. The second one was was money. 
so there's this myth that the gay world is made up of a whole lot of rich men who don't have children who are dying to donate their money and have a pink dollar. Well, that's a myth, a myth. So if you ever look at New Zealand statistics just recently, you know, our, our um, non-binary and transgender people are very, very comparatively uh, much lower on the income. And in fact, many of us actually have extended families that are hugely demanding on our resources. So we had to kind of battle a myth that, you know, there, there are rich gay guys out there who are just ready to throw money at you. So we actually had quite deep discussions with our university around the university's position as providing a duty of care and our position to go to a community where we're always asking each other for money. And if this sits inside a university, what is our what are our dual responsibilities? And that's been a that's been a much more fruitful discussion recently. So um, the um, the access thing became really it, uh, COVID hit us too. So what we realised that was that, um, for instance, a little known fact was during COVID when people were trapped in families. The idea was maybe everyone's making unleavened bread and putting in gardens, and all families were happy. Well, actually, if you're trapped in a family with the religious parents who are very, very anti-queer and you are a trans kid, those kids fled to the center of the city and were homeless. And we were desperately in the middle of the pandemic trying to find shelter for these people who were suddenly in worlds where there was no place that they could reach out. So we know that access is hugely important. So we were balancing safety, um, enablement, an infrastructure that we had and access and trying to bring those into a working dynamic. But from that, we went, we can go forward with this. We have to negotiate with the university in our community. We have set up a we set up a group in our community and a group inside our university of people to monitor this and to keep working with it. So that's how our two communities work together back and forwards. But it was not, but it was not, it was something that both sides had to had to feel committed to. And so we had to show that it was going to work. Thanks, that's that's a really powerful story. And I, I feel like um, it's really important to hear that, to hear from each of you that these decisions were made, you know, with great thought and after, you know, great discussion about what the pros and cons were. And I, and I think that's really helpful for anyone that's thinking about um, setting up similar collections. So yeah, thank you for that, for sharing that. Um, so we've got some fantastic questions in this in the Slido that I'm going to go to. Um, I'm going to uh, take um, Chair's uh, privilege and pick the ones that <laughs> I'd like to get uh, put to you. Um, if I don't get to all of them, apologies. The f I want to just start with one from Richard Richard White, who, who made a really interesting uh, question. So um, we talked about the importance of leadership. Um, uh, about driving change. Um, I wonder if each of, if you could reflect on whether you've seen um, whether access to collection has empowered leadership to come from the community itself as a result of the collection. So um, I might start with Napira about that, if you don't mind. I'm so sorry. I just missed that last little, last uh, little sentence. It was, it was whether or not you've seen leadership um, being empowered by by the collections that you, you've you've derived. So it is leadership rising rising up through the community because of the collection. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I guess I mean, I, yeah, I, we have like what the thing is. Once you open all this data, like you mentioned before, you just don't know where it's going to go. So sometimes it's like when I'm out in conferences and people are like. Oh my gosh, Figure NZ, we use your data all the time. Uh, we used it to raise capital. Um, but I get quite a bit of, um, so I had a Māori uh, researcher, a, sci a scientist uh, at an event the other week who said, oh my gosh, Figure NZ, we use your data all the time, particularly for our diabetic research. And we've used it because it's in such easy ways we can download the charts and send them digitally. Um, we found it a really useful tool, A, for teaching our students, but B, for um, for the for the funding purposes, bringing in funding. Um, but also uh, we hear people using it for strategies, uh, different strategies. One that I heard recently was really cool, was from the Cause Collective here in South Auckland. They have a lot of health-based funding, more for Pacific people. Um, and they said, oh, we just wanted to let you know, uh, we we saw some of your research that you just published on 
what was it, driver's license. So something around um, only 40% of Pacifica adults have their full driver's license, which I didn't know until I saw the data. Um, but they said, we saw that when you published it and you sent it out to us to say, here's some new Pacific data. And that struck us. That struck us as, well. Wow, we actually need a campaign around this. Um, so from that data that they saw in that format, they were now thinking about a campaign. How do we get more of our Pacific adults with their full driver's license um, because it can impact so much on communities if they're not able to drive or keep getting fines and things like that. So yeah, that's one example of how I've heard our data being used. Um, and I love when we hear that, you know, people are actually, it's all about behavior change at the end of the day. Like if we can use the data to make a better behavior change, that is actually our goal. We want our people to thrive. We want them to see information that causes them to change a thing or do something more positively. Um, so yeah, that, that's one example of, of how people have used our data to uh, hopefully do something good for their communities. That's a that's a great example. I really love that idea of using data as advocacy, sort of you know having really strong data make making change. Margaret, what about you? What um, you, how do you see sort of um, leadership coming, maybe being empowered by your collections? Um, I, th I think probably the uh, I think probably the the sorts of collections where we see it making the most positive difference in community is in First Nations communities where so much of their their um, their history and story has been taken away from them. And, you know, I can think of many cases where uh, probably a really good a really good example to use was around um, the commemorative of work, the commemoration of the First World War, and of course there were very different um, different stories and end outcomes for people who were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander and and uh, fought in World War One, and so but we saw some community projects happening in Logan that used um, collections that we had digitised um, as part of our commemorative effort where. <clears throat> First Nations soldiers were, Indigenous soldiers were all identified um, and then that information shared with, uh, shared with family um, and then those um, communities themselves made some really amazing digital stories around the stories of their, their family member and what happened to them when they came back from the war, if they were someone who came back from the war. And there was a real sense of taking ownership um, of telling the story of of that community and of that that family and of those people and you know when you're when you're at a at an event and and uh, you know a, a grandchild um, says you know this is the one and only picture I've ever seen of my grandfather and it's in our collection and it was made live intentionally to be open for use and reuse then you sort of see that you sort of see the power of it coming there and the the use that happens beyond. Yeah, that's a very powerful story. And I remember that um, that exhibition. I remember seeing mm. that. It was amazing. amazing. Yeah. Well, B, what about you? I mean, I guess that what about the leadership that comes through your collections? So, Richard, it was a good question. Right. And um, I had to I'm so glad I was able to go third because I had to give that a bit of thought. Um, so initially, the need for this came from our community. So they were very articulate. Um, and so did one of the governing issues was that one of the Pride is treated as exotic display by heteronormative communities. So if you watch, and then sometimes reinforced by our people. And, and but in research, pride is dignity and pride is uh, standing up as an assertion. So that's why if you look at the site, it's very restrained. It's very dignified. There's no, there's actually no rainbow flags. There's no glittery things. It's very subdued. So we we turn to to our Māori, to, to a Māori concept that is, is is deeper and and less kind of mediated and affected by cliche. Um, so we had we had people who were able to step forward in leadership roles and go, this is the necessity for it. But then we were left with a group of us going with imposter syndrome, going, well, who the hell are we to step forward here? But every new initiative is made up of imposter people with imposter syndrome, I think. So we um we knew that we had to we knew we had to make information more accessible. We knew that an opportunity had come. We had the identi problem identified. And then we had to find people who could take on leadership roles, who could connect. And what we found was 
people connecting both queer and non-queer had a lived connection to the unfairness of not having this available. So, you know, the dad who's got a trans child, the, the, uh, the, the a, a range of a range of people. So, but one of the other things that leadership happened was because of a dynamic. As we saw more people popping up, other people felt affirmed to step forward. So that wasn't something that I was expecting. But once it got launched, we, we got five brave people to profile on there as queer researchers in the university. Then we were flooded with stuff. It was, it was wonderful, you know. And the day after it was launched, we were getting emails from people going, my research is in a repository in University X. Can it be part of ear? And we were saying we we don't want to step into other people's world. We, we will behave generously. We will set this up, share anything we can so that they can do the equivalent. Um, we fortunately had leadership in other models. So most of our research, because of the history of our people, has been set up outside of universities. So Pride NZ with its 200 oral histories, Lagans, Lesbian Gay Archives, they've all been done by our people on the street. So our universities don't have a, a, a good history of collecting and making available. So we were able to go to them to seek advice and seek guidance. And our, our position now is that we're forming affiliations to behave generously and try and use anything that we've found out to share with them and anything they find out so that we get a network that flows out of affiliations that get flow between them rather than somebody trying to set themselves as the monolithic structure because that's too vulnerable if you're an oppressed people that's too dangerous so so the leader it was a really interesting question i hope those points might help add a little bit to the idea of where leadership came from yeah no that's that's a great those are great answers and actually it flows on really interestingly to another question that i'm going to i'm going to put two together both from elliot bledsoe about um so I'll, I'll read about the first one is the information and the technology around it is increasingly controlled by a few companies. Um, and he asks, how do we innovate our advocacy to how do we innovate our advocacy for a more open and equitable future? And then follow up to that is what are the networks and relationships that we need to establish again to agitate for a future? So um, I guess that's outside of your own. So I might just um, Margaret, I might start with you, if you don't mind on that. Who else do you think needs to be involved in advocating for this for a different future? Um, I think the people who use these collections are probably our greatest advocates. The people for whom paywalls and um, difficulty getting the content that they want and um, trying to do research in, with enduring computational methods, and they're, they're probably, I think, some of our biggest advocates. And we certainly have seen in Australia how the the um, uh, the advocates for Trove, um, the community advocates for Trove, um, did an amazing job at raising the issue um, at the government level that has led then to some more funding. So I think um, it's I think there are some challenges in us having that, you know, making those connections and finding the use case for our users to advocate on our behalf. But they're the ones, you know, they're, they're who we're doing this work for, the people who want to use these collections and, and have their stories authentically told and be able to, you know, be able to reflect their data back in a positive way and to be able to, to research into 19th century collections without needing to have two master's degrees. Um, so, you know, I think they're, they're one group that we really need to bring in. And I also think we, you know, as I alluded to much earlier, you know, not being afraid to play, you know, to play tough with um, with uh, commercial providers who want to add our, our collections to their databases that they might be using then as a commercial product to be playing really really tough with them to make sure that we're getting the outcomes that we want um, and that the outcomes that they need so I think that's that's really important and anything that we can do I guess to tell the story of the outcomes rather than just the open access is good we know it's good because we know the outcomes but we have to be able to have that message that goes um, further. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. This concept, open access is not a thing on its own. It's a means no. to an end, for sure. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll go to you next. So what, what what do you think? How should we be advocating differently? Who else would you like to have involved? So I'm, I'm a deep believer in um, knowledge being power and discussion being power. 
So things like this, what we're doing right now, this is important. This is important because it creates a wider variation of perspectives on an issue. And it puts those in. So, so the more people who are thinking and talking about that, the wider the spectrum of, of, of critique that's coming in. I also agree with, um, with, with the point that you made, Margaret, about users are very important. And that's not just academics. Those are independent scholars. Those are um, uh, libraries. They are businesses. Anybody who oftentimes, I, I think for a long, long time, we sat and accepted the monetarization and the capitalizing of knowledge. We just accepted that, that was part of the world. It's not. It's not. Knowledge comes from people. You know, it's shaped by people. And and so on one level, we need these discussions as they're happening now. We need them in the demand. We need them inside on university councils. We need them in the deeper places. But we also need them in the communities in a wide spectrum and not just you know, libraries, universities or whatever. Yeah. We need it to permeate so that the and that and I, I believe it, it is. I think that the, the basic principle of if knowledge is generated and for instance in universities we're paid by taxpayers this is a a long a long story you know, about peter stuber wrote really well about it you know if we if we accept money from the, um, the from taxpayers and under new zealand law we have an interesting provision because the fifth definition of a university is that it must function as a critic and conscience of society you can't be a critic and conscience of society if all your knowledge is being put behind a paywall you can't you can't legally do that. So that level of critique becoming more sophisticated and more logged into the real world, I believe, is a very powerful mechanism mm. and a necessity. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Nipira, what what about you? How how would you like to see us advocating differently for the future? Oh gosh, well we've just come through a big election, as you know, um, and <laughs> I mean I've always am a big fan of collaborating with different people right so even though we're a charity we're very small we can do big powerful scalable work because we've got this little purpose but behind us we have to have government you know there have to be people supporting us in government um we do a Māori project um for example that was a really big deal we don't just launch a Māori data project you talk to hundreds of people in communities in those areas um, we, the Māori project in particular was very controversial, as you know, because it, I did it right in the middle of um, the Māori data sovereignty movement being very, very powerful and strong, which is awesome. Um, but it was a bit of education on both sides. So from the Māori Data Sovereignty Network, my colleagues on this side, they're saying, why are you doing this? Why are you opening up this data when we're trying to protect our Māori data and, and make it in ways that, you know, that we, as our people, can be empowered to use it, but why are you opening it up? So I, I hit a little bit of um, pushback there. Um, you know, and my thing was, look, fundamentally, I just really believe that there's, you know, we don't even know how much Māori data exists because nobody's ever put it into one place before. You know, there could be heaps of it sitting there and we just don't know. Mm. Um, and then I had to reach out to communities and we had a lot of free webinars saying, this is what we want to do. Is there anybody who is upset with that? Do you want to ask any questions? We're open to criticism here. Uh, we Is there anyone else building one? Because we certainly don't want to double up on resources. So it was a huge big effort uh, before we even launched anything um, that we had to go through to say, hey guys, we're hey community that we're building it for. Um, more importantly, is this something that you need? Is there, what are your concerns? Why are you, you know, because when we can hit the concerns or we can alleviate the problems, the idea was we can create a better product, product, uh, one that people, the community feels safe to use. Um, and when we did launch it, people were like, oh, wow, this is really quite great. This is, we've never seen Māori data, so much of it in this way. And we learned as we went along. So one of the things people told us was, hey, we don't just want data in a chart or, or a bar graph. Um, we actually want context. We want a list of 
uh, reports that use the data. We want a list of people so we can go to researchers and experts and say, hey, what does this data mean? And and put some context around it, um, which was great because to me it showed that the communities we were building the tools for really cared about the information and they cared about getting it right. Um, yeah, and I, I started it with Māori for two reasons. One, as I wanted to model being a good tiriti partner, Treaty of Waitangi. What are we doing? We've got to start with Māori first before we do anything. And two, I wanted to prove, I knew that my people would be hardest on me um, and asking me the really tough questions, right? So I knew if I could get through that barrier, I knew that I could get their trust, uh, we'd be all right going publicly. And and since then, communities, different communities came and said, oh, that Māori data project's fantastic. Um, can you build us one for Pacific? Can you build us one for the rainbow community, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's really great, but you have to get community buy-in. You have to collaborate. It was a lot of faffing about for me on the top level, letting uh, Ministry of Māori Development, every, anybody who I thought should know about the project because what you don't want to do is release a big open data project and then get slammed on the other end. So I wanted to make sure our, our data was robust and I wanted to make sure that when we launched, the community launched with me. They already had seen the project. So, you know, when we launched, we had 200 people on our side launching it out to their communities. It was very successful. Um, but yeah, networks, relationships are really, really crucial um, in, in any step of this, particularly when you're building something for communities um, who are, have traditionally been underserved because there will be questions and you want there to be questions. You want people to critique and give you feedback. Um, but yeah, it was still worth doing for sure. Fantastic. Thank you. That was that is such a great way to finish this um, this first hour. So um, thank you very much to our fantastic pan panelists, Napira Riley, Margaret Warren and Welby Ings. I hope that everybody got something out of it. I really apologise to the people I did not manage to ask their questions of. If you'd all like to give a virtual thank you, that would be lovely. Um, we've posted loads of chats, link questions and links in the chat. Um, we will have a minute break now and then we'll come back um, at just after five past for the second half of this session so thank you so much for giving us such an amazing uh kick off to this week this this year's open access week thank you everyone Okay, everyone, I think we will make a start with the second half of our session today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your short break, everyone. So welcome back. Um, my name is Fiona Bradley. I'm a Director of Research and Infrastructure at UNSW in Sydney and one of the members of the Open Access Australasia Executive Committee. And I'm very pleased to be chairing the second half of our session today where you'll be hearing from um, two wonderful speakers on the topic of what is community control and why does it matter? Um, actually, let's go on to the next um, slide. Well, actually, we will be hearing about, we've already heard uh, the first topic. Uh, the second topic of our session today will be when and how can open collections and commercial interests coexist? So I'm very pleased to be um, welcoming our two speakers during this hour, who will each speak for about 15 minutes and you'll have um, time to ask your questions thereafter. So uh, you will see in the chat, there will be a link to Slido where you can post your questions. You're also very welcome to use the chat function, but um, uh, any questions you have are best sent to Slido. So um, you can also, using your favourite social media platform, you can uh, post about all of our events this week using the hashtags OA Week and Open Access underscore ANC on whichever platform you prefer. So I'd like to introduce um, our two speakers who will, will uh, each speak before we have the questions. Um, Emma Juniper is the director at Orform Informit, which is well known to many of you. It's an online database of Australian content owned and managed by RMIT University based in Melbourne. 
And John Walensky is the Cosler Family Professor Emeritus in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University and the founder and co-scientific director of the Public Knowledge Project, which makes the results of publicly funded research freely available through open access policies and strategies, including software solutions. So very happy to turn it over to our two speakers now. You have about 15 minutes each, and then we look forward to the discussion and questions with you afterwards. Emma, do you want to begin? I will begin. Thank you, John. And thank you, Fiona, for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully. I'm not used to Zoom, so I apologise. How does that look? Very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri, Wu Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So hello, I'm Emma Judipa. I'm the Director of Informat. Um, I'm going to try really hard to address the topic today, what is community control and why does it matter, um, particularly in relation to our business informant. So who is informant? We are a not-for-profit business. We are wholly owned by RMIT University. Um, we were actually established within the RMIT library more than 30 years ago now. Um, and since 1989, we have led the way in the internet age to be the core source of online Australian resources. We host the largest collection of Australasian scholarly journals, magazines and videos in the humanities, social sciences and allied health areas. Um, we have relationships with over 700 publishers. Um, Informat really works with many smaller publishers, research associations or niche groups who publish content as mem a member resource in addition to their core business. Um, this equates to hosting over 1.5 million articles, over 1,800 journals, over 450 books and over 1,000 reports and conferences. Um, we consider ourselves to be the hub of the publishing, research, education and library communities in Australia. Um, and with Australasian content creators on one side and academic institutions and learners on the other, um, and a large archive of historical content, given we've been around for 30 years, there really is no one else out there quite like us. So we're unique. Over time, we have worked with a number of specialist organisations to develop special collections. Um, for example, we host the most complete collection of literary magazines um, in Australia with an archive that dates back to the 1940s. We champion bibliodiversity and we collaborate with a wide range of humanities publishers and research centres across the country to make this content available to academic institutions. We also have the most comprehensive Indigenous publication collection in Australia, which puts us in a unique position to be able to amplify these publications and advocate for Indigenous-led research um, to our audiences. We are innovative. In fact, we had the first full text downloadable database in Australia where end users could access journal articles straight from their desktop. And at that time, that was really mind blowing. Um, we also hosted the first streaming video database for the education community, which is now Australia's largest video collection, educational video collection. Um, and this was way before Netflix. TV News is a comprehensive record of over a million broadcast news stories dating back to 2007, and EduTV has more than 80,000 films, documentaries, and television shows. We're also self-funded, which means we have a sustainable business model, and we have actually maintained that for the past 30 plus years. All Australian and New Zealand universities and state libraries subscribe to Informat, which means we have widespread adoption and university students and academics use and value our content every day. 
Our purpose is, like I said, to foster bibliodiversity and promote critical thinking for a better informed and knowledgeable community. Our vision is to be the hub, so the intersection between learners and content creators and ideally the go-to place for all Australasian content. So where are we going? Um, this year, we actually developed our nine-year strategy. Which in progress. Progress. I know is a really, I know is a really long time. My, uh, no, that's okay. I was echoing for a moment there, sorry. Um, so this year, we developed our nine-year strategy. Um, key foci within that strategy, which relates to this presentation today, um, is that we need to maintain a sustainable business model. So we've existed for 30 years because we are sustainable and it's really important that we maintain that. We're also planning a range of approaches to embed first people's perspectives and contributions more prominently within our platform. Um, we kicked off some of those initiatives this year, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a few more slides. In relation to supporting the OA community, the issue is not whether open access is a threat, it is here and it's happening, and it could potentially destroy the bibliodiverse community that Informit represent if we don't better understand what models might finance it and what will make it sustainable for our partner publishers in Australia moving forward. We're also really keen to explore how we as Informit can provide support for that transition over to open access. So like I said, I do want to spend a moment just talking about our First People's Lens initiative as it's an important aspect of our strategy and it's really all about our community. So we delivered three key initiatives under our First People's Lens um, project this year. Um, the first is our Indigenous, excuse me, Scholars You Should Know video series. Um, in this collection, we spotlight current Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scholars at various career stages. Um, we had a launch a few months ago and we continue to add to the collection and we will continue to add to the collection through to next year as well. Um, all the videos are openly available on our site and they're also openly available on YouTube. Um, we're actually quite keen to release the videos under a Creative Commons license for more widespread amplification. Um, we just need to work through the permissions with our scholars first, but it is definitely on our radar to do that. In September, we held a symposium in partnership with Kaval called Kamaji Yelenj, which brought together key representatives from the publishing research and information industries to tease out pivotal issues related to the aggregation, description and amplification of Indigenous publications. Um, and finally, we established the Informat Cultural Fund this year um, and we sponsored a number of projects. Um, the first is the Yalingulth Birurung app, which is a geolocated stories and sounds experience that takes you on a journey through time. It's a free app. It's an excellent experience. So if you're in Melbourne CBD, please download it and go and check it out. Um, you'll learn an awful lot. I really encourage you to go and do that. It's a great experience. Um, we've also supported the Australian Journal of Indigenous Education, which is published by the University of Queensland. This is an OA publication, and we wanted to offer them a small amount of financial support to ensure that they can remain open. Um, finally, we are in the final stages of discussions with another open access Indigenous publisher to also provide a small amount of funding through this cultural fund this year. So once those uh, conversations are finalised, we'll share more details about that. So how else do we support the open access community? Um, we just generally, we add value via, um, by bringing content into our platform, we write metadata about the content and we syndicate it with libraries and discovery partners to in increase discoverability. Um, we also promote content via our social media channels. Um, most importantly, we include the content alongside other important Australasian content within our collection. Um, we do want to be the go-to place for all academic content within Australia, so it's really important we continue to provide our services to the open access community, as well as those publishers who like to remain behind a paywall. 
Um, that means as a user, you will receive results on a topic regardless of whether the content is open or behind a paywall. And that's really important to us. Um, we have seen significant growth of open access content within Australia in the last five years, probably longer than that, but really significant growth in the last five years. Um, we now host, these, these figures are loose because we're working through all our metadata and our really long tail of licences. Um, but at the moment where we stand today, we host 24,000 articles, over 24,000 articles, over 120 journals, 74 books and 17 reports. Um, this represents only a fraction of our content. So it's actually about 6% currently of our, all of our content, um, but still it really has grown and will continue to as more and more publishers transition over to open access. So this here is an overview of what we've done this year in relation to our open access strategy and what we intend to do for the next couple of years. Um, we have acquired new content this year. In fact, 40% of the new titles we've acquired this year have been open access. Um, and this split I've seen increase in my time here at Informit. So when I joined over eight years ago, it was perhaps only 10% of the new titles we'd acquire in a year would be open access. Um, and I think in itself that kind of demonstrates the shift to OA of available content out there. Um, we've reviewed funding models. We're really trying to get our partner publishers on board with open access, as many are unfamiliar with how it works, and still publishing conventional or costly print models, um, often just with a tiny budget. Um, they don't rely on APCs as they don't have the status of academic publishers like Wiley or Taylor and Francis. And for these publishers, they find the costs published high and difficult to fund. Um, and they rely heavily on memberships. So we're working with them to see if we can provide cost-effective publisher services, perhaps on mass, um, uh, to help enable them to continue publishing. Um, read and publish really won't work for our publishers. However, a model like subscribe to open might. Um, we did explore subscribe to open this year. We also spoke to Project Muse about their plans in this space. Um, I would love to explore this further with some of our paywall publishers if there is appetite for it, um, but that's something we'll look into next year, I think. Um, we also developed new products such as Informit Explore that links to existing open access content on Informit to really maximise the reach of that content. Um, this means that high school students, because that's what Explore is developed towards, um, will access and view that content as well, which is really exciting. So we're really trying to broaden the reach for both our open access publishers and also our paywalled ones. In relation to cleaning up titles, we've, like I said, we've been around for 30 years. So that means we have a lot of historical agreements in place. Um, a big focus for us this year was just to try and clean this up identify the open access titles that we host and where possible, renegotiate the license with the publisher to be able to flip them to host them as open access on our platform. Um, our new platform, we upgraded our platform a couple of years ago. Um, it actually allows us to showcase our open access content more clearly to users. Um, and the new technology has also allowed us to have more ownership on how the content is displayed. Um, we can now manage hybrid access, which we really weren't able to do before. Creative Commons licenses are clearly displayed and padlocks indicate where the con content is open access. So it just improves that UI experience. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, cleaning up activities such as this take time. We host millions of records. Um, so we will continue to work through these types of activities for a number of years to come, I imagine. Um, so in 2024, our aim is to increase the OA content we host to around 10%. Um, we really wanted to continue talking to publishers to discuss their options in relation to transitioning to open access. Um, we're even open to some continuing to receive royalties whilst they transition, if that's essential to their continued sustainability. Um, we also intend to bring in a lot of research translation and other grey literature next year, all of which will also be open on our platform. Um, we're hoping to launch a pilot for publishing services 
um, including services we might offer to universities for their publishing outputs. And with our Indigenous publishers and our Indigenous collection, it's such a unique offering. We want to ensure that we support those journals to continue publishing and to possibly transition some to open access so they, that they can reach as big an audience as possible just to ensure that we're amplifying um, that content. It's really important to us. In 2025, the list is a little slimmer at this point. We hope to increase open access content to 14% with a move towards a target of around 20% by 2027. Um, we'd also really like to set ourselves a transition target in 2025 of moving publishers from being behind a paywall to open access. Um, the number we will determine perhaps next year after some further research and publisher discussions um, before we can set ourselves that target. So how can open access and commercialization coexist to benefit communities? Um, not only can they coexist, but at this moment in time, I believe it is essential that they coexist to ensure we sustain the rich bibliodiverse publishing community within Australia. Um, services like Informant, which operate under existing commercial structures, offer the potential to sustainably transition to open access models particularly for the small to medium type publishers that we represent. And we can do this because we're not necessarily reinventing publishing, we are just rearranging the money flow. Um, the key benefit to the community, of course, is that during this transition, there's wider access to knowledge without the paywall structures, um, which is a benefit to the community. I don't know if you're gonna have questions now or we'll go over to John. Thank you very much, Emma. Yes, we'll go straight on to John. Uh, the floor is yours, John. Okay. Actually, I have questions, Emma. <laughs> I'd love to follow up on, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll introduce some of my the questions and answers as we speak. Um, uh, yes, let me, I, I don't have any slides. I could use informant slides. Sure, that'd be good. But I think uh, what I was going to suggest instead um, is that uh, there are 109 people here and we are talking about community and you are invisible. Um, so this is, you've been here two hours, over a hundred of you have been here for two hours, this invisible community um, and visibility uh, has been an issue that we've discussed in the earlier session. So I wanna invite people to turn their cameras on. Um, I'm coming to you live from California and it'd be nice to see that there are human beings. Can we uh, stop sharing the slides? And uh, yes, Margaret, thank you. Jenny, Fiona. Uh, let's see. Yes, we, we've got a few. Donna, no, is that a picture? I can't tell. Um, you, you need to smile or, or move for me to, to recognize that you're, there we go, okay. Um, so I want to recognize that I'm on the traditional territories of the Oleone people uh, here in California. I'm in the heart of Silicon Valley and I'm going to talk about uh, community, uh, not against commercialization, but the coexistence question. I really appreciate having that opportunity and I love the way that Emma set it up in, in, in her talk. Uh, I represent the Public Knowledge Project. There's a link, I, I can update the link here for you in uh, the chat. Um, you can have, explore it even as you put your videos on. Thank you. It's a world of human beings out there. Um, and so uh, I, I wanna talk to you a bit about how we have wrestled with this. The Public Knowledge Project is 25 years old. So I have some experience um, in terms of doing this. Uh, working uh, as a university organization, as a research and development organization within Simon Fraser University, as well as Stanford University. Um, and we have been fiercely independent of commercialization in those 25 years, but we have um, made arrangements and we have become involved in the commercial aspects. Um, and that part of that is, if you're going to be an advocate, and I think again, Emma approached this, if you're going to be an advocate for open access, you have to be open to a wide range. You cannot be an ideologue. You cannot be set in your ways. And, and part of this then is to recognize that the research community is not split. It is largely controlled by commercial interests at this point. 
and we need to be strategic around that. Um, and in despite of that, the Public Knowledge Project has been fiercely open source software. We are, are we provide publishing platforms. Um, and again, Emma, I was going to talk to you a bit about the publishing platforms um, as something you might consider, but we also have been fiercely advo advo fierce advocates of things like subscribe to open. We were part of um, the conception of that concept um, some years ago, and we take great pride in the open, close to 200 journals now that are being funded uh, and subscribed to open, which is a kind of compromise because commercial publishers are using it. Um, so that idea of how we facilitate open access means how do we reach out to commercial and to open source um, kinds of communities, university-based nonprofits, um, community organizations, we heard from uh, those previously. So I think the what I want to describe to you are some particular aspects for our work uh, in terms of this. So we develop a, a software called Open Journal Systems um, and Open Preprint Systems um, as well, an open monograph press. Uh, and we uh, make, this is open source, so it's freely distributed. It's hard to kind of control and, and reckon with. But we have, uh, in fact, for 2022, we have the most recent figures. We have over 44,000 journals using uh, OJS. So this is the largest in the world, um, but it's free. So, you know, the joke is we make our money from volume, um, but we do have to make money. The sustainability question that Emma raised is a very important one. And this begins to talk about the commercial kinds of, uh, of uh, approaches that we have, or commercial coexistence that we have gone for. One of the most important for us, I have to say, has been Google Scholar. Um, this is a commercial enterprise just down the road from me here in Silicon Valley. Um, and Google Scholar reached out to us very early in 2003 and four, when we were just beginning. Um, and they have been deeply committed. And we've had questions about this in terms of our collaboration. Um, but we have, in a sense, worked with them because they served our community. Because no one else was indexing these journals. These, In fact, they are indexing about close to 90% of those 44,000 journals. And the web of science is coming in at like 4% and scope is 14%. So this idea that there are members in the commercial sector that have broader interests than just the commercialization or something we have to look for in terms of alliances. Um, and we have to see and make decisions and, and compromises if you like um, on the basis of the fact that it serves our community that our journals would be invisible without Google Scholar to some extent. And so we've been happy to work with, and they've been very supportive. The bibliodiversity is a very good instance. They are in, both in representing 80% of our journals are in the global South. Um, they are in 60 languages. They're publishing in 60 languages. The software is only available in about 25 or 30. Um, and when we shared this information with Anurag Akura, that is uh, the chief engineer at Google Scholar, he was quick to, well, two things. First of all, he found two languages we hadn't seen. So we were at like 56 languages and he showed us two in our data that we hadn't even recognized, being a smart Google engineer. Um, but he also agreed to expand the languages that he was indexing in Google Scholar to take into account um, those uh, additional ones. We were uh, we went from 56, he put two more, it was 58, and we took that as a challenge and we went and found two more and we brought it to 60. The idea that research is being published in 60 languages is such a challenge to conventional notions of the center and periphery of the global north that it, it just needs to be recognized. And in this case, the, our commercial partner, if you like, in terms of indexing was very quick to pick it up. Another aspect of this compromise or this cooperation and coexistence has been the hosting question, the publishing services question that Emma raised. That we have, um, and I was one of the ones who said it first, I have to admit, that we shouldn't be doing this, that we shouldn't be hosting commercial um, entities that are using our software. We shouldn't be providing services to groups using OJS if they're commercial. Well, luckily I was overruled and overrun on that proposal because now they, those groups are cross subsidizing the open community. We have only about 700 journals that pay us to host and provide services. And those 700 journals are in a sense subsidizing the 40,000 journals. 
And it's not quite as simple as that, but there is certainly an element of that that I think we need to recognize. So again, it's this, this matter of not of, of having principles, by all means, let us be principled, um, but, but for looking for those advantages, looking for those opportunities that will help the larger community um, and help us, in a sense, achieve these larger goals. And this leads me to the third and, and the final, but really the major one I want to ask you to consider in terms of the coexistence. I want you to acknowledge that there is uh, an opportunity here. Maybe not acknowledge, maybe just receive, but let, let's see what I can do in terms of this, because I wanna talk about copyright reform as an area of commercialization that we need to give serious consideration to. Um, and I wanna set this up in a, in a couple of ways. Um, the first is to say that things have changed. Uh, 25 years, I get a right to say that a few things have changed in the 25 years I've been at this. Um, and, and one of those things that have changed is I went, we went from fighting publishers to singing kumbaya, to saying that open access is the common goal, to seeing publishers falling over each other with their new open access embrace. They have advice about open access. They have waivers for open access. They are constantly coming up with new journals that are open access whether it's Elsevier, whether it's the American Chemical Society, whether it is any of the big publishers. So we have a consensus and we're not taking advantage of it. We have an agreement on a principle that is important to us from the commercial sector, the nonprofit sector, the university sector, and we're not taking advantage. We're not exploiting, if I can use that word, this consensus. And I wanna say that because this consensus is something I hoped for and wished for, and I got what I wanted. And you know, as you might tell your children, that when you get what you want, it's not always what you want um, because we're getting open access at a very expensive price. We're getting $10,000 plus articles and APCs. We're getting a very slow transition to open access that Emma reflected and that the publishers are slowly moving towards and we're getting transformative agreements that are not transforming in a due process. Given the pandemic we went through, we cannot be delayed in having access to this information. So I want to suggest to you that copyright is actually part of the problem. We're working with a copyright from the age of print. This is not true for video games and copyright. This is not true for cell phones and copyright. It's not true for music thanks to Taylor Swift and copyright. Now, I'm not gonna do the Taylor Swift imitation right now. I just want you to all kind of hum along with me though, in terms of this thing that we're going to do, this, this breakdown that we're gonna shake it off and we're gonna to move towards a more cooperative approach and community approach. And we're gonna do that because what Taylor Swift actually did was she pulled her music off Spotify in 2014, and in 2018, the US changed the law for copyright and streaming. Now they changed the law for science in 1976 when they allowed us to photocopy an article. I don't know about you, but that's not quite good enough anymore. But for Taylor Swift, they changed the law in a way that really fascinates me, and I think it's one we should consider. Let me just very briefly introduce it to you. It's called compulsory or statutory licensing in music. Taylor Swift doesn't get to set the price. That is so important to me because I don't want the publishers setting the price anymore. I want to have a fair market price. I want to put an end to monopoly pricing. And that has happened in copyright when it comes to music. It has not happened when it comes to scholarship. And scholarship was at the origin of copyright. It was an act for the encouragement of learning in 1710 when it was first introduced. So I want you to consider opportunities that you might have to raise the copyright question. Again, you don't have to do the Taylor Swift sing-along thing, but you can mention that there are legal remedies for what is called a market failure that we have in open access. We're not setting a fair market price with open access, and we're not moving with all due speed to an important goal for the future of humanity. 
the market is not delivering. And it's because copyright, at least one factor, let's not exaggerate, I'm sorry. One factor is that copyright accommodates exclusion, exclusive licenses, infringement. It's great on those aspects. It has no accommodation or provision for open access. So what would that look like? What would a Swiftian transformation, ah, the Jonathan Swiftian, no, no, the Taylor Swiftian transformation. We could do the Irish, no, no, that's not. But transformation. So here's what it would look like with a statutory licensing license, very briefly. The license is a, a, an agreement between two parties, typically. In the music industry, it's there are nine different licenses. There are many parties. But in our case, we have the publishers and we have the users, the libraries representing them, the consumers, the patrons. And so what we need to agree, and we already have agreed that we all want open access. So that's the first thing. Copyright needs to say that research publications, not anything else, research publications, because I don't know if you've noticed, but research publications are their own form, their own economy. They're not novelists getting rich off bestsellers. They are faculty members being promoted and tenured, and it's a different economy. They're already paid, they don't need the royalties. So we need an agreement that research publications are going to be open access immediately with no restrictions for which the publishers need to be fairly compensated. That's how it works in the music industry. Taylor doesn't set the price. Anyone can sing her music however badly, but they need to fairly compensate Taylor. According to copyright judges in the US, in Canada, it's a board. In the UK, it's a board. It's probably a board in Australia. So the setting of prices could be something that librarians would be very active and informed about in terms of what they would, it's called a willing buyer and a willing seller. They would be willing buyers on, under certain conditions for certain kinds of, of publications, for certain services around indexing and other things. So there are legal remedies. And in, in the United States, it's, it's 113, 112, 113, 114 years old, um, this, this form of, of statutory licensing. It goes back to piano rolls. It's a, a, a global system. Taylor can, is flying all over the world right now, doing quite well, because there's international agreements around these kinds of licensing. It is something that we're overdue in the United States since 1976. So if you do the math, we're getting on to 50 years since the copyright has been updated, where it's been updated for every other field, uh, every other form of, of cultural communication except scholarship. So this isn't easy. This is a very big lift. But it is something that starts on this notion that we have a consensus, that we're not in opposition to the publishers, we are sharing a goal that we have concerns about pricing, but we want fair compensation, not no compensation, that we're not trying to put them. I mean, I did try to put them out of business for 25 years. I did build a system, a software system that is larger than any of theirs in a sense. But I'm now in a position to say that that's not going to deliver what we really want. We don't want a winner here. We want universal sustainable open access. So let me leave it at that. And thank you again for giving me a chance to speak to something besides the black screen um, and to be able to see that there have been seven smiles so far, uh, which I always appreciate. Uh, well, it's up to 12, okay. Um, and I'm not even shuffling through the screens, there are five screens. At any rate, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, John Walensky. Thank you, Emma Juniper. And we have lots of time for your questions now. Um, so if you haven't already found it, there should be a link somewhere in the chat um, before all of our fascinating discussion that we've just had about Emma and John's presentations. Yes, fantastic. There's a link right there. Please go in and have a look at um, the Slido to ask your questions. Um, and while you're doing that, let's get started on, on some of the burning issues people have already put in. And, and Emma and John, th these questions are, of course, open to um, 
both of you at this point, whichever ones you would like to address. Now, here's a good one. Um, how much tax do commercial publishers pay governments and to what extent are governments dependent on that revenue? Emma, take it, please. I don't know the answer to that question, John. I was hoping you were going to jump in. They they pay uh, a very, uh, they don't escape taxes. They definitely pay and they are not just, the governments aren't just dependent upon them. Governments are heavily lobbied by them. And we've had in the United States, we've had Elsevier in about 2012 intervening, sponsoring bills that would have defeated the NIH's public access policy. Um, and they were called on it and they stopped that. So the, the taxes are an important aspect, but I also wanna say the taxpayer question, we often hear open access is a taxpayer's right um, and we in the United States, this has been a very big aspect in terms of arguing. Taxpayers have a right to this knowledge because they funded the research. I want to say no. They, I mean, they have a right, yes, but it's more important that it's good for the research. It's not because you paid for it. It's because the research that is open is better research. The research that is open contributes to the goals of a larger, well-informed society even though we have some resistance on some points in that regard. So the, the tax question is, um, I don't want it to distract us, but it, it has play in this. And I don't want to put the publishers out of business in that sense. There are a huge number of employees. Um, I'm only asking for fair pricing and I'm asking for steady, sustainable progress towards universal open access. Um, another question for you both, and, and something um, I suppose that hasn't really been uh, touched on necessarily today, but has been obviously a huge point of conversation over the last few months, um, is, is a, a great deal of discussion about the uh, impact of large language models uh, and where do we think uh, we might be going in terms of web scraping of open materials for training um, generative AI tools? Do you think there might be some further impacts we haven't yet seen for open access or for copyright reform? I mean, that's part of our nine-year strategy, isn't it, to kind of understand the impact that might have on our business? Um, I think certainly AI... Um, could potentially uh, tip um, our business model um, over, to be honest. Um, I don't have any answers to it, but I think certainly in relation to your question, um, it'll, it'll, it'll impact, there'll be change, I think, as a result. I'm not sure what you think, John. Uh, the US, always quick to reach for the gun, as has come out to say that AI cannot be an author. Actually, nature too, so let's not, not just the US. Uh, so the, there have been really very quick rulings on it. I want to point out one thing that I am very interested in terms of AI uh, and, and its access to our resources is the, the, the question of hallucination. People are very upset that AI hallucinates references, for example. Um, and I'm the first to say, of course, it hallucinates references. Any student would do that who didn't have any access to anything. People in deserts hallucinate oases because they can't, they don't have any access to water. So I want to encourage, in fact, the opening of the research, the body of literature to AI scraping so that we have a much better informed AI and we have much better knowledge discovery than we would otherwise. That's not the authorship question. That's the access. So I think we do, and again, this is a part of open access is to say the public needs access to this information in an age of misinformation. Oh. And AI is part of that. And if we continue to close, uh, I mean, Emma, you said 14%. I think the literature is more like 30% is open right now, but that's missing two thirds of the citations and two thirds of the literature in terms of the ability to scrape. Now, some of that may be sci hub scraping and there may be other kinds of activities going on. But I, I just want to say, I think it's in our interest if we are advocates for research to say that it is fair dealing and fair use for these systems to scrape the knowledge that is should be publicly available 
and could be used in powerful ways for uh, translation, medicine translation for drug discovery and other aspects. The question of authorship, I think we're going to spend some time working out what it means for peer review, what it means for literature reviews, what it means for um, just authorship generally. And I want to say that we need, and, and our students in the classroom are a very good example of this. And we're just beginning to see faculty members who are coming up with innovative ways of engaging students in the use, in the productive use of ChatGPT, for example. So I think we need to be principled, especially as librarians, your voices are going to be very, very important in terms of this access question to AI. And there are major lawsuits in the United States, and I'm sure in Australia they'll be starting um, with the leading authors, with John Grisham and uh, others who are suing because they, they, in fact, I just read an article and the author was saying, they knew all my minor characters. ChatGPT knew everyone in the book. Nobody else knows that. And like that is against the law. I thought that was like a compliment. That was that could promote sales instead of discouraging it. But at any rate, allow let the foolishness go to the side here, and just say that AI is part of the picture, and we're all in the midst of it. All right. So let's have a look at um, what else people would like to hear about. So I mean, what I would take very much from your comments there, Emma and John, and also from both of your presentations, you both talked about. Um, a range of pathways and in and, and effect being very pragmatic. And I think, John, you said something right at the beginning about, uh, you know, you can't be an ideologue if you're an advocate. So there's this re acknowledgement reflection that there are many different business models and players in this landscape. Now, to come to one of the provocations in the chat, and uh, I think based on, on what you said there about the diversity of approaches and uh, working with commercial and other routes, how would you respond to this one? So uh, the comment is, uh, if video shops went out of business, why should publishers not go out of business as we increasingly digitise and go open? Emma? Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess I come at it from, you know, we're, we're, we're an aggregator, so we're not a publisher. I think that's important to understand. So we, we host... Um, and in, in my mind kind of represent, you know, a, a whole lot of um, small to medium academic publishers out there. Um, and I, I think the issue that I have with that comment is that the publishers are the ones that will suffer in the end, particularly those small to medium ones who where, you know, publishing content just isn't... Um, isn't the main thing that brings in revenue for the organisation. They could, they could be a, a small research organisation and they have a, an array of other things that they do. And this particular journal is just one aspect of what they do. Um, so if you want to make it all open access and provide zero revenue back to those publishers, um, those small publishers, then that they'll just cease to exist. They won't be able to continue publishing. So it means that we lose all those really important small voices that are out there and we get a really kind of generalised voice, which I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't promote that either. Um, so I, I, I think what I was saying, you know, I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure that it can be all or nothing. It's really, we've got to be really careful with the way um, that we navigate this space because the impact could be really devastating to um, the academic community, content creators um, in, in our, our country. I, I would I hope be allowed to draw on this history I have or on this, my age, I guess, as it were. For 25 years in doing this, I started with the notion that we would attract everyone away from the publishers. Who would want to work with a commercial publisher when you could work with a homegrown open source software platform that was locally established? Um, and many of us, and, and including the library community, have offered services and support to move away from the commercial sector, to move away from the commercial publishers. We have tried in every possible way, and the publishers have not been providing the best service in the world, and they've been charging whatever they want, and they have only increased their market share. 
they have only established a strong hold on our colleagues, on faculty members. And I have been long coming to this, but I just have to respect that. I have to say that faculty members are very happy with the big five publishers and will continue to be happy with them. And that's why I've switched from just trying to cajole everybody to say that we need to work together on something like a common cause, sustainable, universal, open access that includes the publishers at a fair market price. And I think this idea that we don't need the publishers is true at one level, but it it goes, it flies in the face of what the academic community has told us, which is they do need and want and enjoy. And I don't blame them. I mean, you know, think about the mothers and fathers who receive the, the nature articles from their children who finally graduated and are having a great success on Lancet and nature and other sources, like the, that's understandable. But what I think we do need to do is call this common cause, this, this consensus that we have on open access and to talk about it in terms of sustainability, which is not the case right now, and to talk about it in terms of universality, which is not the case right now. And that to me is the way to go forward. Whether the the shops will close the video, I mean, Netflix is a good example of going from a mail order business to a very successful transformation. And the publishers are pretty good at doing that kind of transformation. They went from print to digital and only consolidated their market. So I'll draw together, you know, probably a few threads that are in the Slido um, I guess is a way of sort of closing out our session and, and focusing on some of those areas where we do have commonality and, and are working across our entire sector, no matter what business models stakeholders are working in. Coming back to the um, the topic of copyright, so we're seeing good progress um, in Australia, New Zealand and other regions around rights retention. Um, many library organisations have been working at WIPO on copy reform copyright reform for many, many years. Um, there's lots of other activity around um, copyright reform. Um, what would be some practical steps that um, people watching this session today can do in their own institutions working with researchers or in their own libraries um, to start bringing together that sort of reform movement and common message across stakeholders? Emma? You, you can tackle that one first, I'll come. I'll come. Okay, I, I'm very happy to, of course. Um, so I would say that, that you need to support your library organizations where you have copyright professionals, where you have advocacy groups for copyright. You need to e express an interest in seeing the issue explored. That's as simple as that. You need to make sure that it's occasionally on the agenda that many university libraries have copyright specialists and that professional organizations, uh, the ARL here in the United States, Carl in Canada, where I'm from, um, these organizations want to reflect the membership's interests. And I think it's, it's as simple as saying, have you considered copyright? So have we got copyright on the agenda here? Because I think it's the, up to the librarians, up to those who are advocates as we are, and I count myself as a faculty member in that camp, to, to, to represent the interests of faculty members on this issue. The publishers will have a great interest in it. And what is sustainable and what is universal is something that we know better than anyone. And we can help with that. We know that the research publication is operating on a different economy than novels and poetry and screenplays, as well as music and other forms, and that it has a right to be identified as a distinct intellectual property in copyright, which it is not at this point. It's grouped in most jurisdictions under literature. Now, I love being grouped with Margaret Atwood by all means, but I, I, it's not serving this goal of universal access. Sustainable, sorry. So let's let, repeat after me, sustainable universal 
I have to remember myself, sustainable universal open access. And we need to ask ourselves, and, and uh, secondary publishing rights or re rights retention is not universal and it is not sustainable. It means you pay the publishers whatever they want and then you retain a right after six months or 12 months. It is, it doesn't provide the price check. And if Taylor can accept a price check, then Elsevier can accept a price check, okay? Thank you so much, John. Now, Emma, if you have any lingering thoughts, please put them in the chat. We are at time. Um, thank you all very much uh, for joining the session today. Huge thanks to um, Emma Jennifer, John Walensky. Big thanks also to Donna Coventry, Janet Catterall for managing the slides in the chat. I'd like to encourage you all to continue to follow our website for our upcoming events throughout the rest of the week. Our next event is Like an Open Book, Can Academic Communities Ensure Our Voices Are Heard by All? And that's taking place tomorrow. Thank you all so much for joining us. There's so much more to talk about and we'll talk to you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, John.